Welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Sam Metz, a member of the City Club's Forum Board and the producer of today's program. For more than 100 years, the City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Sentinel Hotel where thousands of people are watching, listening in, and participating by radio, TV, and online. Listeners are here via X-Ray's FM's website and radio stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app and TV viewers will watch a recording of today's program via Open Signal's community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing Friday Forum to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week, Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. There aren't many people in Oregon who are happy with our tax system. Personal income taxes are high, our corporate taxes are low, there's no sales tax, and we have this strange refund mechanism called the kicker. The result is that state programs, especially education and healthcare, are strained for funding and the tax burden falls heaviest on low and middle income taxpayers. How did we get here and how do we get to a system that is fair and adequately funds our government? Joining us today to offer both a history and some solutions are Vicki Berger, former Republican representative of Marion and Polk counties in the Oregon House of Representatives, and Dave Hunt, former Democratic majority leader and speaker of the House in Oregon. Moderating the discussion is Caitlin Baggett Davis, the founding executive director of the North Star Civic Foundation. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you for that introduction, Sam. I'm Caitlin Baggett Davis. It's so nice to have all of you here today for this important conversation. And it's really wonderful to be here with both of you. Vicki, thank you for driving up to Portland. When I explained to my 12-year-old this morning what I would be doing with Vicki and Dave today, she said, that sounds really boring. <laughs> and I said, well, it's important. And she said, exactly. <laughs> So I thought that the title for this program was really funny. It's sort of a loaded question, what went wrong? It does make you wonder, does anybody think that it isn't broken? Vicki, you offered to give us a, a five minute history of where we are. And, and if you don't mind starting with what went wrong as the intro, uh, take it away. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, being asked, I retired from, I, I went into the legislature Look at the smiling lobbyists down here. <laughs> um, uh, Wide-eyed, thinking that I was um, going to do lots of things. I came out of a school board setting and, and business setting, so I, I knew those subjects. I was going to fix that. How'd I do? Uh, and uh, somebody put me on the revenue committee, and I kind of scratched my head and said, what's the revenue committee? And then it was explained to me, that's the tax committee, and nobody calls it taxes in the building because no self-respecting politician wants that association with the people that were taxers. So I spent 12 years on the tax committee. In the end, I forgot to worry about education because I was too worried about the money coming in for education than ed policy and really the legislature is a bad place to do ed policy in my opinion. But uh, so I spent 12 years on taxes and now that I'm retired, I am truly retired. But when I was asked to come and talk to you, I said hallelujah, there's really people up in Portland who want to spend an hour with their eyes glazed over talking about taxes because it's my favorite subject and if you want to do that, boy am I here. 
So uh, I see some familiar faces in the room who I, I, I don't want to speak to the choir, but I did want to start with some baseline information about why Oregon is crazy, uh, what Sam was talking about when he said, what a system. But I want to caveat, you can say what went wrong, there is no wrong or right. This is policy. This is the system that we have for one reason or another developed, and if it doesn't suit us, then we need to think about how else we could do it, and I think that's the purpose here. So let's start with what we have, um, and let me describe it to you. The metaphor for tax policy in states is the three-legged stool. I know you've probably all heard it, and in an ideal world, all three legs, which are property taxes, income taxes, and sales taxes, are roughly the same size, and if one kind of goes one way, the other goes the other way, and your stool is balanced. And it's a metaphor. No state really has it. Some states have better than, a lot of them have better than we do. But every state has a, some sort of profile within those tax buckets. Now, there's lots of different kinds of taxes. But you can kind of throw them in those three buckets if you want to. You can say, well, this kind of acts like a sales tax, so it is. We'll throw it in there. This is a corporate tax, but it acts like a income tax, so we'll throw it in there. So, you know, all of this is so high level that forget it. So you have this stool. <clears throat> and Oregon, in a, in a way, looks balanced because if you took per capita amount of taxation and say, where do you rate among the 50 states? 25th, brought down the middle, nowhere. But that's where the profile ends. We all know we have no general sales tax, so take that leg right off the stool, and all of a sudden your stool is lost all balance. Then we imported from California that wonderful thing called property tax limitation. It was the worst import we ever made from California. I'm sorry. <laughs> And it's not that we shouldn't have limits on taxes. Remember, I'm a Republican. But it's the way we did it that has left us 20 years later uh, in, a, in a Gordian knot that is literally unfixable. What we did was we took these ideas by initiative and threw them in our Constitution. And some of them were unworkable. And then we came back and tried to make them workable. And those are back in the Constitution, and they're not very workable. And over time, the, the worst of it is in our Constitution, we have these absolute limits, unindexed, you know? $1,000 for education, or what is it, the, the, and 500 for for general government. But they're absolute numbers, they aren't indexed, and you know, we're down the road. So what we have in my description in property taxes is a constraining system. And right now, local government is, is sinking under it. The state, however, the big impact it had on our taxes was that we were, by this constitutional mandate, required to make up the difference in education dollars. So before this import from California, we were players in education dollars. Now the state is the player in education dollars. And so it drives other things into a side while we try and manage the expenses of an education system. So that's the state thing. Um, I will say um, that voters don't see how out of whack this is getting, and they do appreciate the, the constraining pieces of it. And when you go out and talk to voters about property tax changes, they go, wait a minute, my taxes are already high. And actually, compared to other states, we are pretty high. We're, we're above the average in ours. So they're not wrong in that, but it's a wacko system in our Constitution. So what we're left with is the third leg of the stool off the charts, personal income taxes. And, and they are off the charts. We are number two in the nation in that little venue. And the, there's some good things about it that Oregon values, and that is progressivity. If you earn more, you pay more. And we have earned income tax credits which do protect the poor from the income tax extremes. Uh, but overall, its worst problem is that it 
booms in a good economy, grows like a balloon, and we're in the middle of that cycle right now, but like a balloon if it's pricked by things that we can't control in Oregon, it collapses like a balloon. And when you have education and healthcare dollars on the line, it has immediate and negative impact for Oregonians. So right now, things are looking really good, but I can guarantee you, winter is coming. <laughs> we have been through this cycle before. It isn't a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when we have some other kind of adjustment, and we don't know what form it'll take, but it will impact our tax system in a major way because we are so volatile and sensitive. So that's what's wrong. One other point I want to make before I shut up, few people understand we aren't stupid down at the legislature, except sometimes. And we did think about a rainy day. And there is a rainy day fund. We, when I went in in 03, uh, there wasn't. And there is now. And I checked on what's in it. And right now there are two funds, the general fund rainy day fund and the education specific rainy day fund. And there's going to be over a billion dollars in that fund by the end of the biennium. So when the winter comes, be aware there is a little backstop there besides the kicker. <laughs> so I will end there and hope that kind of puts you in the picture of what the profile of Oregon looks like and what we're trying to manage. So helpful to start off with a little primer on how we got here. You know, one of the things that, that we need to reckon with is that Oregon used to collect more taxes per capita than we do today. And that the shift has been, the shift of moving the burden of paying taxes onto households hasn't just been a shift of moving the burden, that we have also seen a shift of overall having fewer dollars um, to work with per capita. In 1980, businesses in Oregon paid close to half of all state and local taxes in the state, and today that obligation is about a third. Dave, could you talk about what that means for us? I, I can. It, it's definitely been, it's been a dramatic shift, and it's like the passage of Measure 5 and 50, it did not result in someone else picking it up. The theory, I think, of 5 and 50 was, well, we'll just limit these taxes, and the state will figure it out, and everybody will be whole. The theory of lowering corporate taxes, I think, was the legislature will figure it out from some other source and program and services will remain whole. That, that hasn't happened. In fact, the, the latest numbers I looked up uh, show that um, you know, the shift from the mid-70s to now, uh, today corporations pay less than 7% if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, general, the general fund, less than 7% which means that the, the burden has been disproportionately shifted back on small businesses and especially on individuals through those personal income taxes that Vicki was talking about. The, the most amazing part to me is we're now collecting more from the lottery, which is basically a tax on poor people, people with gambling addiction, people who never learn math. Uh, <laughs> that we're collecting more from the lottery than we are from corporate taxes. So we clearly are, are out of whack there. Um, and, um, and, and that, that, that's created a significant problem. The, I think the one other piece of the problem, and Vicki intimated it right at the end, was related to the, the kicker. Because when the limits on the kicker were put in first into state law in the, in the 80s, and then into the Constitution in the year 2000, uh, the intent was to limit spending when times are good. When we hit the, the height of those cycles, when the economy is rolling and taxes are being generated, the intent was let's stop the spending, the investing of those dollars and services at that point. The problem is, so it did that. The problem is it also prevented any ability to save significant enough money in a reserve fund to protect those critical services when times are bad. So it had its intended in fact, effect. It just had this major unintended impact. And I, I think it's why a whole range of people, including we heard last year, uh, Newt Bueller, the Republican candidate for governor said, we should put the rainy day fund into, uh, or put, the, put the kicker, a personal kicker, into a rainy day fund. And it's the, I'm not a fan of super majority vote requirements, but I actually think the vote requirement in a, in a rainy day fund makes sense to have it be a super majority because you can lock the dollars away for when there really is a recession 
and then the legislature has the ability to protect those critical services uh, during those times without making massive budget cuts. I want to stay focused a little bit on corporate taxes, in, in part because so much of the conversation over the last few years has focused on the reality that to raise revenue at the scale Oregon needs, corporate taxes are probably the place that we should be looking. Um, and there are many different options on the table in Oregon right now about what that would look like. Businesses need investment in public services to grow, to profit, to serve their customers. So I guess a starting question for me is when you are talking to business leaders, is your sense that the level of investment that they're making now is providing them the services that they need? You can start. I, I, I think totally not. I mean, I just look out over this audience and issues that I know a lot of you care about, whether it's uh, community colleges, whether it's early childhood, whether it's foster kids, whether it's housing. You, you talk, I mean, I talk to business owners all the time, especially out in Clackamas County, and they, totally do not believe that, that we're adequately investing in those things and probably a whole range of other things uh, to give them the kind of workforce today, the kind of future workforce, the kind of uh, education system that their employees, will, that they'll be able to attract and retain employees and families here. So there, there's no question that the system we have is not generating, uh, if you just look at businesses and business owners, it is not generating the dollars we need to protect those critical services. And as you said, I think there are lots of options. I mean, as, as was mentioned earlier, Oregonians are not, I mean, I wish John Horvick from DHM Research was here because he could go into a whole hour just talking about poll results. But I, I would summarize what I've heard from John before by saying Oregonians do not want higher personal income taxes except maybe on really wealthy households, there might be a slight asterisk there, but in general, they don't want higher personal income taxes, they don't want sales taxes, they don't want higher property taxes, they don't want higher small business taxes, but they're very open to higher corporate taxes. And Oregonians say that, but, it, but even that's a category in and of itself where you can look at um, you know, things like increasing the cap on the corporate minimum tax or uh, eliminating or, or changing the rate on the corporate minimum. Uh, there was a great article in Willamette Week that I think just came out uh, yesterday uh, that was talking about requiring complete reporting by multinational corporations where there's really a, a bleed of, uh, of dollars, uh, are basically artificially shifting those profits overseas. We could switch to a business activity or value-added tax. There are a whole series of things that are within that corporate tax change realm that don't require going off onto a sales tax or, or property taxes or other things that Oregonians won't buy. I think there are several things that Oregon voters will buy. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Caitlin Baggett, and I'm speaking with former state representatives Vicki Berger and Dave Hunt. Vicki, you are itching to jump in. Please do. Raising corporate taxes is a straw man. Take out your arrows, shoot at Walmart all you want. The profile for Oregon is we have very few corporations, organized C corporations in our state, and even fewer of them are multinational, and even fewer of them make money. So you can tax those people till you're purple and you're not going to get very much money out of it. So when you hear that corporate tax straw man, think business taxes, because that's really what you're talking about. And the most frequent business formation in this state is a C corp. So when you say corporation, generally the straw man is that multinational Walmart corporation. But when you look at the profile of business in Oregon and over the last 30 years, it has completely transformed from C corporations to S corporations, which is your mom and pop, your little, your big, your lawyer, your doctor, your Indian chief, and just about everybody else. So when you start talking, when you hear that, oh, raise the corporate minimum, problem solved, sorry, no. It doesn't solve the problem to just call them a corporate corporation and kill the straw man, okay? It won't get us out of that. So what we're really talking about are how to get corporations to be more engaged in a tax structure without hurting 
our business base, which we desperately need to be hiring people so they have income, so they'll pay personal income taxes. Because the danger always is businesses go bad, and we've seen this happen in, in bus. When businesses aren't hiring people, people aren't working, and they're costing us money, and they're not feeding the income tax system. So just be careful with that corporate straw man thing. We're talking here about business taxes and what, how you could get the better participation from business in our tax structure without hurting our economic prospects. And that is a really trick, a really difficult trick. Vicki, you talk about the, um, the need to get business leaders more involved in solving this problem. Could you reflect a little bit on how the civic leadership of business groups has changed over the last 30 years in Oregon? And I want to recognize the Oregon Business Council here and other business leaders. Uh, what I, I, Kaylin, I can't talk to the last 30 years. I can only talk to the years that I have been involved, and they have been at the table every time. Anybody remember the Nike bill? Um, I, 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 you, Oregon Business Plan, Oregon Business Group has been at the table. We've had, they, they have talked to the legislature repeatedly. I would not say they have been absent. Are they raising their hand and said, tax us um, and problem solved? Of course not. They understand the difficulties of, of getting at this. But I would not say they're unmindful. I would not say they're unmindful now because they can also see that uh, elections have consequences and maybe you noticed this state turned bright blue in the last election cycle, and what that means for business is we're not going to be looking, we're going to be looking in certain directions politically in our tax structure, and they all know it's coming, and they're very willing to come at the table, come to the table and say, in fact, there are certain businesses who have been talking to retired tax experts in this state about how to structure this thing, and the devil's in those details real details. It, it isn't so easy to just say, put a tax on a corporation. If that corporation is low margin, high volume, we saw that in Measure 97, it just doesn't work, you guys. It, it, it doesn't. So we need a little more nuance, and we need the business community to be right there at the table to put this thing together. Dave, it sounds like you have a response. I mean, I think there is a difference between being at the table and actually being willing and able to get to yes. I mean, I, I would tell a, a story of two tables. Uh, Vicki and I were uh, at the table over months and months in 2009 negotiating a transportation package. Business was very much at that table, very committed to getting to yes, got to yes. We ended up passing a bipartisan uh, bill with strong business and labor support. We lost you know, some Democrats on the far left who didn't want to build new lane miles and some Republicans on the far right who didn't want to, to raise taxes and fees, but people at the table were committing to get to yes. I would also note I've been at a bunch of tables discussing corporate tax increases where there have been business leaders there, business representatives there, but a lot of them I think in some cases it's been an unwillingness to get to yes. It's, in other cases it's been a, an inability just based on their memberships to get to yes. Uh, there are definitely some exceptions. There are some individual businesses who are exceptions to that, and I think we're seeing that play out through the Coalition for the Common Good right now. But, uh, but just having tables, I mean, I, I think Vicki's right. Dave, there, can you explain who the Coalition for the Common Good is? I can. I mean, it's still largely in formation, but it's a coalition of uh, folks really from a variety of perspectives, from labor, from healthcare, from some businesses who are saying we need stronger education funding. Pre-K through higher ed, we need as a state to invest in that. That's a big deal for Oregonians, and the way we're going to get there is by uh, making some increases in corporate taxes. The level of detail is still in formation, I think, beyond that. But, but, it, but it's absolutely critical to be able to get, not just to sit at the table, not just to be engaged in the discussion, but to actually be committed to getting to a solution that is going to not just be additional modest tweaks. We've had modest tweaks for a lot of years, ever since Measure 5 passed, and we're still not getting the investment that business or any Oregonians want in, uh, in our kids and in our communities, and we, we've got to have folks at that table who are willing and able to get to yes, and I think we can do it. We've talked a little bit about ballot measures 5 and 50, and, and, and um, 
when we talked about corporate tax rates, the difference between our numbers, I had a third, you had 7%, is the difference between the state of Oregon and the whole state of Oregon. Uh, corporations don't just pay taxes uh, affecting the state, it's for the whole state. And one of the things that's really tricky about talking about revenue in Oregon is that with two former state representatives here, of course we're a little bit focused on the state government of Oregon. But Oregon taxpayers don't tend to differentiate between where their taxes are going and where their services are coming from. But so far as I can tell, do we have a governing body in Oregon that is responsible for understanding the fiscal realities and fiscal challenges of every government in Oregon? Yes and no. Um, it, it is true that we have levels of government and you could, you could go down and pick up your phone and call your city manager or your city, uh, Oregon, uh, Portland is an outlier in terms, I, I, you all realize Portland is a, not only in terms of its tax system, but its government system, it's not like any other community of its size, I don't think in the nation. Um, it has this tax commission that is completely different than what other agencies do in terms of tax reporting. Uh, Portland has some unique things. Other than, <laughs> when is that report coming out? <laughs> <laughs> but but that's your choice. If you live in Portland, you can manage, and and that's the sort of the heart of our government. Who should tell you how to run your city government? You, or me from the state level? And this is one of the tensions that always exists within level of government. Um, sometimes the state does tell local government how they're going to do things and boy you you get pushed back and other times we don't and you can get pushed back for that too so I, I don't think there's a governing thing but that's part of this whole issue around how much government do you want and who do you want telling you how you're going to do things that is a tension within our system that is real and probably a good thing the challenge underlying that, though, is that for Oregon state government and for every local government in this state, you can't talk about revenue, as we are today, without addressing the structural imbalances that are a result of measures 5 and 50 and other unfunded commitments that the state has made. And that those decisions should bring all of these different governing agencies together, but I don't know where that should happen. Well. I I think one, I mean, I, Vicki and I actually both served on uh, K-12 school boards before we were in the legislature, and that was a lot of our motivation for running for the legislature, because like our friend Bobby Regan over here, we saw the problems. You get in that, that position and you think, oh great, I can actually reduce class sizes. I can actually extend the school year. Wait a second. No, I can't because I'm not getting adequate funding from the state. And uh, I serve on the Clackamas Community College Board now, and it's the same exact situation. I think one of the instincts, and this is true of, I would say, almost all local governments, their instinct is to just say, this problem can only be fixed in Salem, which is largely true. Therefore, they just point the finger at Salem and, and aren't engaged necessarily in the dirty work of, we need to actually be out there and, and fix, help fix this problem. I'd give a great example, since I already mentioned Bobby, when we had the double majority election requirement in the Constitution, the, uh, it required a state constitutional amendment, so it had to come from the legislature to fix that, to remove that language from the Oregon Constitution to allow local governments to be able to pass measures with a simple majority, again, the way it used to be before Bill Sizemore put that in the Constitution. And it required action by the legislature Vicki was one of the chief co-sponsors from the beginning. It took us three sessions and a majority change to get that out of the, uh, out of the legislature. But to s some people like Bobby, as local elected officials, engaged going out and campaigning for it, going out and meeting with editorial boards about it, and that kind of action, I think, is exactly what has to happen again. It's, it can't be just the legislature passing something because it will inevitably be referred out to voters. It's going to be on the ballot, ultimately. And so I think every uh, community college board member like Kali, every K-12 board member, every local official has got to be engaged and out there. 
And I know the people in this room are probably disproportionately ready to roll on that, but that, that's got to be true around the state. It can't be just the legislature uh, passing it. It can't be just the presence of a campaign. It has to be every, uh, every local official who recognizes exactly what you talked about, Caitlin, who recognizes the problem but is willing to be engaged in, uh, in advocating with voters and putting some of their political credibility on the line to, uh, to help pass it. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Caitlin Baggett Davis, and I'm speaking with former state representatives Vicki Berger and Dave Hunt. All right, it's 1980. Mount St. Helens, is, Helens has erupted. John Lennon was murdered, and the kicker law was passed in Oregon. It's a tricky year. Recently, Speaker of the House Tina Kotek said, we have a PERS liability problem. We have a $26 billion legacy debt that we have to pay. The kicker is in the 800 million range. If we take it and pay down some of the debt, we will relieve some of the pressure on school districts and local governments. I want to put this in context. That $26 billion liability is about equal to the size of the state of Oregon's general fund budget. But nobody expects that obligation to be paid all at once. There's a payment plan. That payment plan is set up to pay out over the next 20 years. The next biennium bill is about $4 billion. So that $800 million in the kicker is an important amount of money. Our analysis at North Star is that if that kicker had been invested, if that rebate had, inv had been invested since 1995 and applied to this liability, it wouldn't be a $26 billion liability. It would be closer to a $12 billion liability. Is it a good idea or a bad idea to direct revenue, to direct new revenue to address this liability issue? Can I start? You may. <laughs> In 1995, if we'd made some very different decisions about PERS, we would not be having this conversation. So I, I don't want to revisit history, but it was in the 90s when decisions were made about PERS that we knew you could read the actuarial tables. It was in the press, and decisions were made that got us here. So I, the kicker is the kicker. I don't, want, I don't like the combination, frankly, of, of mixing the two. However, if the voters of Oregon, let's put it on the ballot. The kicker only kicks in a boom time. And if the voters of Oregon want to go to the ballot and say, well, let's change that constitutional provision. And take that kicker money when it kicks and apply it towards K-12 education directly, which would have a better chance of going, or unfunded liabilities in our pension obligation, I think that's a good thing. I think Oregonians could make a choice like that. The other way of doing the kicker, but it is constitutional, and, and so the voters have a, a voice here. And I think that the legislature and the policymakers need to respect that and let them decide if, if that's what they want done with the kicker. But the taking away the kicker will not suddenly make us stable. It only kicks in boom times. It doesn't kick in bad times. So it is not what I would call a dependable source of revenue for anything. It was designed to put a break on the, go growth of, the growth of government at a time when the electorate felt government was out of control. So let's put that in context. And if you don't think government growth is out of control right now, and you want to change the Constitution to use that money differently, put it on the ballot and let's see what the voters have to say. That's how I feel about the kicker. I, I, I do the one other opportunity on the kicker, and actually Vicki and I in 2007, both voted to redirect the corporate kicker into the creation of the rainy day fund that she mentioned earlier. That, that can be done, with the, requires a two-thirds majority, so not just three-fifths, but That's a two-thirds majority of the legislature. And that same thing the legislature could do with the personal kicker, 
th right now, in, without a vote of the people, it could, they could redirect with the two-thirds majority into, uh, into buying down the PERS liability. I, would, I, I, I view that very much like I do putting it into the rainy day fund, at least in terms of a one-time action. Uh, if we're looking just at a one-time action with this $800 million, I think you're basically accomplishing the same thing. Whether you're putting it in a rainy day fund to guard, help guard against cuts in the next uh, you know, post-recession biennia, or you're buying down personal liability, which is going to reduce costs in those future biennia, it ends up having the, the same effect. I, I think if it's a permanent solution that's going on the ballot, my guess would be, talk with John Horvick first, but my guess would be that voters are much more likely to redirect the personal kicker into a rainy day fund long term than they are to, to redirect it to, uh, to buy down purse debt. But I would be willing to be proven, proven wrong by polling data. <laughs> Poet Mary Oliver passed away earlier this week, and I brought a poem of hers to share as our final question for the three of us together. Mary Oliver wrote, I want to think again of dangerous and noble things. I want to be light and frolicsome. I want to be improbable, beautiful, and afraid of nothing, as though I had wings. Isn't that a great poem for Oregon, who flies with her own wings? So my final question for us before we go to audience questions is, what would Oregon's tax system look like if we were afraid of nothing? Well, we'd have a sales tax. Sorry. <laughs> it's stabilizing in a bad time. And we would reduce our, uh, our rates, our personal rates. Um, we would unknot um, the constitutional uh, piece in our uh, property tax system, which isn't going to happen because that's unrealistic, um, but we would get to a, a, a more reality-based system. And people would jump for joy when somebody said, oh, I'm going to go to this meeting and spend an hour talking about this really boring subject, <laughs> OK? And say, I need to inform myself not only on the details of, of how democracy works, but engage myself always in these important questions, even though they are death by boring. That's my happiest moment. I, I think if we were afraid of nothing, we'd probably look at, and I wish I had it to quote, but there's a provision in the Oregon Constitution that actually says a big part of the legislature's job is assessing what the need is. What is the need for our kids? What is the need for our communities? What's the need for our businesses? What's the need for our working families? And to assess that, to design services, not over and above services, but critical services that meet that need. And then, if we were afraid of nothing, figure out how we're going to come up with the revenue to actually fund that vision. If we were afraid of nothing, I think that's where I would begin. The fears that the two of you described were a combination of political fears, the need for political courage, and the fear of knowing the whole size of the problem. Are those two things related? I, I, I think they are. I mean, it's. It's, I, I find one of the challenges in the legislature, and I think you probably have a bad sample size here because I think Vicki and I were often willing to vote for politically unpopular things. So we're probably not your average legislative sample. You think that's right, Berger? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, but I think, I mean, you have, there is always going to be an element with elected officials where they're going to have to look at what is politically possible. And I, I was ne I'd never felt comfortable asking a legislator to take a tough vote on something that I thought there was a good chance that voters were going to overturn it in the next election. 
because that's not really asking for courage from my point of view. That's asking for people to go up the hill on something and not get the policy benefit. At least if they're going up the, bit, the hill on a tough policy or a tough revenue vote and they can see the benefit of how that makes life better in their districts and, and for their constituents, then that's a fair trade. You're taking a political risk, you're taking a political hit, and you're being able to see the benefit. Uh, so that, that's where I come back to, uh, I mean, p political courage, I think, is, is doing the things that are hard but still possible. I, I have to extend that story because I'm the person that did that. I came in as an incoming Republican freshman and took a vote that was against my party, against my leadership, and against everything in order to close down the longest session that the state has ever had in 2003. Remember that, Dave? I did it. It went immediately to the voters, and the voters overturned everything we did. And there were members of my party that didn't come back because of that vote. And do you guys remember who, Grover Norquist? Yeah? One of my proudest possession is a poster he put out from Washington with my picture on it, <laughs> telling the world that I am a famous rhino, right? Republican in name only. That's one of my proudest uh, legislative achievements. So I took that risk, and the voters turned it down every piece. It got me nowhere. But here's the funny thing about that tax package. Almost every piece of it has, since between then and now, been enacted and put into our tax code. Almost every single piece of it. So we got there by a different route. It's an interesting world. And another more positive <laughs> example that I would share is, I mean, if you look back at the, the legislature's passage of what became 66 and 67, uh, I think particularly of Bob Jensen and Greg Smith, Republicans from, uh, from Eastern, Northeastern Oregon. Uh, they both voted to pass that. Voters, and the difference between 66 and 67 and, and what became Measure 30 back in 2003, is 66 and 67 were much more carefully crafted to be something that could pass the legislature and be passed by voters. So that, I think, has got to be, because anything the legislature passes will be referred out to the ballot. And so navigating that dual track of something that will pass the legislature with a supermajority and pass voters has got to be key. The, but the best news of the, the end of the story with, uh, with Bob Jensen and Greg Smith is they both had primary challenges in the next election, and they both trounced their primary challengers. And so they got, they took, they went up the hill, took the tough vote, got to see the benefit and continuing benefit of the investment of those dollars in services in their districts and across our state and survive the political hit on them. So that, I think, is the optimal situation, is to, to be bold but to be smart. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Caitlin Baggett, and I'm speaking with former state representatives Vicki Berger and Dave Hunt. Let's now go to the audience for some questions. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for City Club staff to collect. You may also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag FridayForum. To City Club members who would like to ask a question at the microphone, make sure you let a civic scholar go first in line. Then, when it's your turn, please identify yourself as a member and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. Wynn Wakala, City Club member. I used to be the auditing supervisor for the City of Portland's um, Business License Bureau. And I would find families who would buy big buildings downtown, depreciate it out, and then sell it to another family member. That way they never had any income to pay taxes on. They just keep selling it back and forth. And I, so there's dirty things like that going on. And then I also wondered about mortgages. I don't like someone buying a $2 million home being able to write off all their mortgage interest. There should be a cap. Uh, these, are, uh, these are tax administration issues. Um, I have a happy story I have to tell you because nobody knows it in the state of Oregon, okay? In the middle of Cover Oregon, when we were all very upset about the rollout of the IT thing and, and Cover Oregon was a big scandal, 
the legislator fund a core system replacement project for the Department of Revenue. That is taking their entire computer system and changing it over to a new one. It was an IT project and Cover Oregon was all splashed all over and nobody knows that the state of Oregon changed their fundamental IT system in, within the Department of Revenue at the same time. And the reason you didn't hear about it is it worked. And the reason we funded it was exactly as she speaks. There's taxes, but there's also tax administration. And it too, you can bleed money out the back door of a tax system if you're not, that's why we funded that IT project in the middle of a mess, because we were working off a 1980s system that was on COBOL for heaven's sakes. So thank you for bringing up tax administration. It is part of this discussion. And I think when to the second half of your question related to uh, mortgage interest deduction, I think there's no question mortgage interest deduction is wildly popular and serves a really beneficial purpose in terms of encouraging home ownership. I think there's also no question that by allowing me and the wealthiest person in Oregon, which are not in the same income bracket, I just want to clarify, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't need, Berger doesn't need an unlimited amount of mortgage that we can deduct from our taxes. I mean, there should be some reasonable amount that doesn't hamper home ownership, doesn't, uh, doesn't hamper the, uh, the desire to encourage and grow that. But also, I, I mean, I think it's completely reasonable to establish some, and it would have to, it couldn't be a, a fixed dollar figure, like Vicky said earlier, you can't put fixed dollar figures in statute, but to have something that adjusts over time that is a reasonable amount that does, uh, that does reduce the size of that, uh, that tax expenditure that goes out the door right now. Kathy Moyd, member of the City Club. I'm also an AARP tax aide. And one of my concerns is it appears that the Oregon taxes are not very progressive. Uh, there are a number of cases where we've had people who had no federal tax and yet still had to pay Oregon taxes. And I think uh, a couple of things are the, uh, the standard deduction in Oregon is ridiculously low and the Max, high tax rates kick in at a much lower income. So I'm wondering when you're reevaluating tax rates, can you also consider making it more progressive? We've worked on that. And actually among the states, we are considered one of the most progressive because most of the, the personal income tax comes in at the high income. Uh, I would encourage you to connect with some of the advocates who are always in the building about earned income tax credit. I'm getting nods from some of these lobbyists who have been in front of, in front of committees to, to talk about who is falling out of, because Oregonians value this in a huge way. We really don't want taxes from poor people. Um, and, but our structure is a little wonky -ish at the bottom. We, we supposedly have, it goes from zero to 9% in a New York minute. Right. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of, it's, it's supposedly graduated, it isn't. And that's where people get caught up. That's the point I was trying to make. Yeah. I'm Bill Harris. I'm a member of the City Club. Uh, my question relates very closely to the one that you just dealt with. How has our tax system contributed, that is our state tax system, contributed to our great income and wealth disparity in Oregon? Oh, you got a lot of time. Go ahead, Dave. I, I mean, Vicki was absolutely right on her previous answer. I mean, we, although our, our tax system in Oregon could be far more progressive than it is, if you look at all the state-by-state -state comparisons, we are one of the most progressive. And that's largely because we don't have a sales tax, which by definition is regressive because if uh, a, a billionaire and a minimum wage worker go out and buy a loaf of bread or a tool or whatever, they're paying the same, they're paying the same amount. So I think there, there, are always, there are always changes that we can make that will make the system uh, fairer and more equitable. Um, and, and I think this is an opportunity. I mean, when we're looking at, uh, at, at corporate tax changes, especially this year as the legislature is looking at that and voters will be looking at it when it's referred out to the ballot, whatever they come up with, I think it, what you said is a very important lens to look at all those changes through. 
and uh, it should improve stability, it should improve fairness, it should, it should improve equity, and it, and it should uh, help address adequacy. I have a question on an index card. Um, it's a two-part question, and I think the second part might be the place for a more interesting focus. The first is, how will the increase in the minimum wage over the next few years change our tax income? It seems like it should make it go up. Yeah. Uh, the second is, what other mechanisms for redistribution of wealth are there? But it's an interesting question. Is the purpose of taxation to redistribute wealth or to fund services? And that's a fundamental question that we need to answer first. Because the, in, in theory, your tax system is to fund services that we could not fund for ourselves, not to redistribute wealth necessarily. But uh, it is also true that Oregon does not have a lot of rich people living here who are paying taxes here. <laughs> if you go to Bend, you will find mansions aplenty whose owners have Washington addresses because Washington has no income tax. And they're right next door. So. The, my answer to that question is ask yourself, is the purpose of taxation to redistribute wealth or to pay for services? And in the middle somewhere is where you get in terms of you don't want the poor paying for everything. They can't afford it. You don't get the services anyway. But on the other hand, is, is wealthy a crime? Sorry. Dave, do you have any thoughts? I, I, I would agree with Vicki that the purpose of taxation is to provide adequate services. Uh, but I think making sure we have a very progressive system, that we have an equitable system, uh, it has got to be a key value of that. The good news, I think, for Oregon is we're starting from a place of relative progressivity compared to other states. So we can continue to make changes. Actually, Wynn's previous question related to home uh, mortgage deduction, that would be uh, I don't consider that redistribution of wealth. I consider that building a more progressive, equitable tax system. I think the, uh, the, you know, the, the passage of 66 and 67 added both some stability and some increased progressivity. So the good news is we're starting from a place of relative progressivity. There is always more that we can do. I don't think the goal for me would be redistribution of wealth. I'm so fascinated by this question. I just need to ask one more follow-up. If our current tax structure distributes wealth unequally, should tax policy redress that? The growing wealth inequality in our nation is a result of tax policy. I, 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 was, I was just going to know. Yeah, I wouldn't say it isn't necessarily tax policy. There's a lot of other policies besides tax policy that have contributed to our decline. Um, and a lot of those didn't start in Oregon and won't end in Oregon. Um, and it is true that uh, you walk out of this building and if you aren't disturbed by what you see, you should be in terms of the poverty that is suddenly presenting itself. But I wouldn't necessarily put that at the place of tax policy as much as a whole bunch of other policies. And, and not all problems are just solved by pouring more money into it, um, unless it's somebody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> I, Oops. I, 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 think, I, think, I think most of it is um, not a tax issue. There are a few things like refundable earned income tax credits where you get almost as a mix between a service and a, and a tax. But I think most of it is, I mean, I would just look at some specific services. I mean, I look at my kids' classmates who graduated from Gladstone High School six years ago and two years ago. There are many of them who would have loved to go to college and don't view college as being accessible to them because of their family income situations. I don't think there, I don't know of a way to solve that through a tax change. But there, there are definitely some ways to solve that in terms of access to a community college or university education through tuition, through state support. So I think we can address it on the service side. It, it, that's very difficult to address, except in some limited ways, I think, on the revenue side. 
Fascinating question. Fun to go into the unknown territory with you guys. All right, Colin, go ahead. You stole my punchline. I'm Colin. I'm a City Club member. Um, I'm wondering, I'm hearing about the challenges created by the kicker, by Measure 5. Um, there's obviously challenges created by the supermajority requirement to pass taxes, challenges created by the ballot measure system that lets voters allocate revenue without, or yeah, allocate expenditures without creating paired revenue. Um, all of these are constitutional problems. Do you see any merit in a constitutional convention to just relook at Oregon's constitution yes. comprehensively? You? Uh, absolutely. There is so much. There's so much. Don't read the Oregon Constitution because it will depress you. There is so much stuff in there <laughs> that is really statutory stuff from some from recent history, but mostly from a long period of time, and, and it really needs and a change. City Club, Col take that on. Colin, I nominate you for that committee. I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one question, one final question. My name is Elsa Porter. I'm a City Club member. Uh, all of the policy issues that you have discussed uh, and said need to be referred to the public uh, distress me because my question is those policies need an educated public, an educated citizenry. How in this era of uh, TV news and so forth uh, does, do you think the public can be adequately educated? I, I actually must say I am continually impressed by the Oregon electorate. Let me give you two examples. One was even though Oregon voters passed the double majority election requirement, having seen it in place for 10 years, Oregon voters came back and reversed it and took it out of the Constitution. They were willing to see through a new lens with more information. I was really impressed and frankly surprised in the 28, November 2018 election that voters rejected measures 103 and 104 because instinctively those kinds of measures that are basically focused on trying to tie the legislature's hands and keep down revenue, those have been very politically popular in the past. And the fact that Oregon voters were willing to look at those, to, to read about those, to learn about those, and then overwhelmingly rejected them actually gives me a lot of hope. My last chance at you. There is a document. It is online. Okay? It is everything you ever wanted to know about taxes, and it's called Public Finance Basic Facts, and it is under the Revenue Office of the Legislature. I challenge every one of you to call up your senator or representative and say, I heard about this Basic Facts document. Would you have your staff copy off all 130 pages of it in color and mail it to me? You'll find out in a minute how responsive your legislators are because that's what I did and I got a copy. And in this is not only way more than you ever want to know about taxes, but a whole page that's very simple to read that says if we implement a one cent or 6% sales tax, how much money would it come in? If we were to do this cap or that cap on property taxes, what would that change? It's a, it's a simple thing in the middle of this document that answers every question you ever had about what are the simple things that you could do within your tax structure. Get this document or read it online. You could read it online. But I challenge you to call your state representatives and say, I heard about this document. I want a copy. Can you mail it to me and just see what happens? And with that challenge, <laughs> our time is up and we'll have to pause the conversation for now. Please join me in thanking our panelists and Sam Metz for producing today's programs and everyone for wading into the treacherous waters of Oregon's taxes. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>